Hey there, Refuge Church. Welcome to another week as we talk about the kingdom of God, what it's supposed to look like, how we walk in it, all of the above. I'm going to pray and we'll get kicking. God, thank you so much for these statements that you have made about our identity, about who you have made us to be. I pray that um, you would be in our ears to hear, in our hearts to receive the things that you have for us. I pray that um, we would be able to say yes to whatever it is that you are calling us into. Be in my words that they might be living and active and full of you and nothing else. Um, and attend to us by your spirit that we may... Uh, receive a greater encounter of you than we dared anticipate. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So we are in the Sermon on the Mount, right? In Matthew 5. And Jesus has been talking us through our identity. So the Beatitudes, who we are uh, in God. So even if we've been marginalized, even if we're on the outside, we are the ones at the very center of what God is doing in the world. His kids given a new destiny, um, a new calling, new privilege. Um, after that, we have salt. So that's what makes things holy, we saw from Tanakh. Um, and so just by being, just by uh, being who God made us to be, that is how we bring holiness with us and transform our environment. So now here's a third identity piece that Jesus has for us to hear. This is a super, super common um, verse, or series of verses, there's three. And so I did a translation that's meant to knock us out of our lullaby effect. Um, and that is going to be Matthew 5 verses 14 through uh, 16. All right. So Jesus says, you are the shining rays of the universe. You are a bustling city laid upon a hill which cannot be concealed, nor would a candle be kindled to be placed under a basket, but it would be placed on a menorah to radiate brilliance to all within the household. In the same way, shine your light in front of humanity that they may be captivated by your beautiful and good business and honor your Father in heaven. All right, so the way that we're working through these different teachings of Jesus are these four layers of uh, interpretation that we are expected to be able to follow. Um, this is not my conspiracy theories, you know, finding weird connections in the text. This is what was expected. I was called stringing pearls. So when Jesus talks about pearls before swine, that is a reference to this specific way of interpreting the word. Um, so first we look at the surface layer, the Peshat, what's immediately there that we can all grab a hold of and say, yeah, that makes sense, that's good. And then we're going to look at Remez, which means hint for what it's connected to earlier in the text. And then we're going to look at the Drash, which is uh, the uh, seeking out the meaning of that. Uh, the last layer, of course, is Sod, and that's when the Holy Spirit reveals something to you. But... Peshat. Peshat means surface. So what's on the surface here? If we look through this shining rays of the universe, bustling city on a hill which cannot be concealed. That concealed there is crypto, by the way. Here we have uh, Jesus hating NFTs. Um, no crypto allowed. That's a joke. Uh, okay, so what do we see? Shining rays of the universe, bustling city laid upon a hill which could not be concealed. All right, bustling city on the hill. What did that mean in this culture, right? Um, sometimes this also gets translated mountain. Uh, so a city uh, is important in the landscape of the first century for a couple of different reasons. It wasn't that everybody lived in cities. Um, they were important, crucial places for a number of people. So number one, if you are poor, uh, you wanna find a city because the cities at their gates, the priests are working there. Ding, 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 we're supposed to be royal priests, right? That's part of this whole kingdom thing. Um, so if you're poor, you can go to the gates 
and you will receive welfare basically you will receive um, food and help there might be a priest there to evaluate your situation and help you um, and we know that this is true archaeologically because there's these piles of bowls and um, utensils and stuff that we find at the gates the gates are part of the hub of the city so if you're poor and you're walking you see a city up on a hill you go that's where I'm going. Um, maybe you're in a different village that didn't have the resources to sustain you after maybe you're a widow, your husband dies, um, the social network is not all the way set up to support you or your family decides not to support you. You wanna make your way to a city where you can find food to eat. All right, so that's if you're poor. If you're sick, similar deal. Uh, there's gonna be priests in those gates that can come up and um, help you through your cleansing. If you're a leper, it's gonna be where there's a community of sick people outside the gates, right, that you can join in um, with. And so you wanna find a city. Um, if you're a nomad, uh, like when the people came into the land, when the Israelites came into the land for the first time, they um, made these little elliptical groups um, of their households across the land and they were nomadic mostly and they had livestock and different things that they would sell and those trade connections were really important in the city so city is also a hub for the community to come for economic um, prosperity of all people um, for their bartering system that they had going on right so if you're poor if you're sick if you are a trader um, if there is a time of danger, so there's a siege coming, there's an invader coming, there's a famine, there's a fire, there's a drought, all of these things lead all the people in the surrounding area to a city because a city is going to have an established um, source of water to sustain the people inside it. It's going to have walls as a place of defense. So if we turn the light on all these images for the church, First off, we should not be the invaders. We should not be the violent ones causing distress to the local government and our community. We should be the ones who in times of distress, people come to us uh, for shelter, for um, care, for nourishment, for safety. That should be our identity, who we are, that our community knows in their time of danger, they can come to us. In their time of sickness, they can come to us. In their time of poverty, they can come to us. And that's corporately, as well as Jesus is gonna dial it into individually as well. We start at this corporate, who are we as a people? Are we a refuge for those around us who need us? And then we're gonna dial in, which is cool. The second part that I want you all to see from this is that it's on a hill. So um, in when we're in lands that have been occupied for a very long time, so including in the Americas, uh, we have versions of this, but also in uh, the, this particular area in the Levant, which is the, this section of the Mediterranean, but all over. Um, if a group of people who is deciding where to live, um, indigenous people, find a place that they think is good, um, they're gonna wanna stay there. So that location is gonna have good access to water, is gonna have good defense points, it's probably gonna have good shade if you're in a, a hot environment. It's going to have um, places for either agrarian activity or hunter gathering activity, right? Or good place for your animals, all of those things. It's hard to find a perfect spot. So when they found a perfect spot, they would settle on it and they would not move for generations and generations and generations and generations. So when we're doing archeology, span we can find places that there were settlements because they literally formed these hills, these unnatural things that come up over the land. And the reason that they make hills is because when the people want to um, make improvements to their city, they would not destroy what they were on, they would build on top of it. And if there was a major hub 
that they wanted to keep, they would just build it up, build on top of it. So it's a new layer. Sometimes we think that it all gets destroyed. Um, those are called destruction layers. And we do see those, but usually in the life of a city that can have 20 strata in it, um, there'll be two destruction layers. So uh, again, we turn the lights on on this for us. Hopefully the work that we are doing is not um, that we have chosen to destroy everything that we came that came before but rather to say we like this this isn't helpful we don't think this is in line with uh, God's character but this is and so we're gonna build on top of it and this is the cyclical nature of things we don't need to desperately try to hold on to one layer that's unnatural um, but we also don't need to like set everything on fire that's not the best foundation we want to build up to make this hill uh, which also becomes a better strategic point over time by the way so that's called a tell an archaeological archaeological language so tel is the hill that these cities are going to be on so hopefully let us be people who are a refuge who are a haven for those who are wandering for the refugees for the poor the sick for people looking um, to be able to share what they have right we want to be that but we also want to build on the work of previous generations without destroying it all but still freely saying yes yes no no definitely not yes that's the goal city on a hill bustling city on a hill which cannot be concealed. All right. Um, he also says we're a candle. Uh, he says, nor would a candle be kindled to be placed under a ba basket, but it would be placed on the menorah to radiate brilliance to all within the household. So when we see lampstand, that is just a deletion of um, what we perceive as Jewish culture, right? A lampstand is literally a menorah. If you Google it, Google lampstand, menorah will come up. Okay, but that's not the point. The point is we're not to be a candle kindled and placed under a basket. We are made for a reason, uh, and that reason is significant. And the way you have been formed is glorious and important um, and flawless in its original design. And so uh, we have still the tendency to place ourselves under a basket, which is not our design. We are not meant to hide away our identity. We are not made to hide away our gifts and who we are in order to try to fit the expectations of us um, from our community or our culture or all sorts of things. That is not the intention. Um, but I do want to point out a candle that's placed under a basket as long as it doesn't accidentally set the basket on fire. That candle is perfectly happy, right? A candle is not bothered. It says it's not going to be bothered if I put something over it. It's going to keep on keeping on. So sometimes when we've built little empires for ourselves of comfort, of entertainment, of never getting outside our comfort zone, we might not even notice that we've put a basket on. We're like, yeah, everything's good. Everything's in line. I'm struggling to keep burning here. So I'm going to not worry about uh, my placement, right? But that Jesus is calling them into something different, not just to worry about staying alive, being in survival mode. That's not our design. That's not our call. That's not why we were made. We are made to be our unique, glorious selves in front of everyone so that we can bring our light to the whole household, to everyone in the household. Right? Non-discriminatory, equal blessing just from being yourself. This is the exact same as the salt earlier. There's nothing that needs to happen to a candle, right? If it's already burning, it does not need to like activate to suddenly give its light. It is just being itself brings light to people. So that's our Peshat, right? Shine your light in front of humanity that they may be captivated by your beautiful and good business. That's just a different translation of good works. What we are going around doing in the world. Good works has all this like salvation theology connotations. So what is our business? What are we going about in our day-to-day -day life? That doesn't mean like work vocationally. Just I am about the business of leading this church. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff that I do, do, taking care of my family, all of the above. Um, that is part of my good and beautiful business. 
And when I live into who I am, and when I have God's vision for myself, I don't want to be anyone else because I'm so excited about who he made me to be. Um, just me doing me is captivating to the people around me and brings honor to God, which we're going to talk about that later. Um, all, all that honor stuff might be a little ooh, to some of us if we're deconstructing. Um, we're going to get there. Hold on. Not in the sermon, but later. All right, so that's our Peshat. Lots of good stuff there, right? We don't want to have disdain for the Peshat. We want to honor the Peshat. So that is all surface level, good, good stuff. But there's more. Um, so, of course, in the Ramez, which means hint, it's a key back to something else earlier in Tanakh because these people knew and they loved their Tanakh. And, of course, um, with the translation of light, you are the light of the world, right, that we're probably used to. We might even be able to think of it because it's such a famous passage. Um, this is drawing back first to Genesis 1, the creation story. Now, uh, if you're new here, we are not people who are really riled up about um, interpretation of the creation story as a scientific account that's meant to tell us exactly what happened. Um, if you want to use it in that way, you're welcome at the table and that is A-OK. -okay. But what we don't want to happen is we don't want to lose uh, we don't want to lose the point of the passage. We don't want to lose all the good stuff that's inside of it. So when we look at Genesis 1, we don't want to immediately get sucked into a culture war. We want to look at what it says. So if we look um, at Genesis 1, and I'm going to pull out verses 17 and 18 specifically, um, it's talking about God makes the light, right? Very first thing that he does. We were the first thing on God's mind, right? If we are the light of the world, he creates light. First thing on God's mind, that's pretty fun. Um, and he gives it to separate between light and darkness. And we're gonna talk about that in a bit um, when Jesus does in the story. So we're gonna skim over that. Um, but very specifically, um, we're going to look at verses 17 and 18. So it says that he made these lights and verse 17, uh, vayaten, so he gave them. This is the word gave as like gifts. We are not weapons um, in the hands of God in this particular metaphor. We are not crushing fists. We are gifts. Hopefully we can live that way. Um, so he gave uh, us as gifts in the hammered vault of the heavens. Uh, to light the earth and to rule the day and in the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and morning the fourth day. All right. So, oh boy. So we're going to talk about separating between light and darkness later. That gets into like judgment territory. Jesus is going to talk about judgment and a hot sec. So, there's that. There's this division thing that we'll get to, but also what are they supposed to do? And he talks about this light is going to be here and it's for this reason. And this light is going to be here for the purpose of ruling over the day and over the night. And it repeats that twice, once in uh, verse 16 and once in verse 18. So apparently it's important. Now, if we're supposed to be the light of the world, right, and we're supposed to, or the shining beams of the universe, uh, this is us, right? And that immediately makes some of us really uncomfortable. The idea of having power and authority and ruling and reigning um, can make us uncomfortable for three reasons, right? Some of us have experienced abuse of power and authority uh, in rulership, right? And so the very idea of having it ourselves is something nauseating because we've seen it weaponized against other people to smash other people into the ground. And so thankfully, we do not want to participate in that. That's our gift, right? That we will stay away from doing that for all of our days, hopefully. Um, some of us also sometimes vengefully want to gain power so that we can make sure that never happens again um, through Christ through healing, um, we don't seek that. We don't need to squash others in order to protect ourselves, right? We have a good protector um, who is just. 
Okay, so that's the first reason that we might be, oh, I don't want to rule and reign and have power and authority. That's that's sketchy because the people around me who do that, sketchy. Uh, agreed, <laughs> but we're going to look at a different way of looking at it in a second. Reason number two that that might make us really uncomfortable. Some of us got raised in the posture of God over, right? King and country. And um, we talked about these different postures of life with God last summer. Um, and we saw that we can try to have life over God where we use like God and his values to organize our life, but it's not relational. We also saw life under God where the whole point is that I stay in my lane and I do what I'm supposed to and I be a good person. Um, and I check all my boxes, whether that's theological or behavioral. And then at the end, I'm all good and I get to go to heaven and we're just supposed to be wee little me, right? Um, we're not supposed to be people who are armed and clothed in power, as Jesus says before he um, ascends to heaven. Um, and that is not in line with the rest of scripture, right? We see God choosing people to co-labor with him all the time. Um, he gives them power. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He gives them a word to share. And it's not just this, um, just keep your head down and try not to get noticed until you die, which how depressing is that, right? That doesn't fall in line with the heartbeat of our soul, which unless it's been really squashed, wants significance and wants our lives to matter and have a meaning. Um, so that's the second reason we might be uncomfortable. Oh, no, God's supposed to be the good, big, huge one, and I'm just supposed to stay in my lane, which in that, like, do stay in your lane, but that doesn't mean that your lane's this big, right? We need to be listening to God about where our lane is. Um, and then the reason number three that we might be uncomfortable with the idea of rulership, power, and authority um, is that there is a branch of evangelicalism that's super creepy, um, is often pretty nationalistic, right? Um, and it's the idea that God created Christians to take over the world, kind of. It's a very Illuminati theology, though of course they don't call it that. Um, and it's just the idea that Christians know what's best all the time, and they're the ones who should be in all the positions of power. Um, and so we should try to get as much of that kind of power as possible and hold on to it and not share it with anybody because that's a God's will for our town, for our city, our world, whatever. So we want to stay way, 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 way away from that because why? We're supposed to be servants, right? We have this throughout the text and we're going to look at it in a minute. That's not God's, I don't believe that's God's intention for the church. It's not to try to wield that kind of power. So what kind of power are we supposed to use? I'm going to look at this framework, um, which is from the social work world and the science of social work. Um, and they have a super helpful model of uh, power over versus power with, power to, and power within. So power over is the one that gives us the heebie-jeebies that's maybe been a source of abuse in our lives. So I'm going to read this is from the science, uh, what power over is. I'm probably sound pretty familiar. Power over is how power is most commonly understood. This type of power is built on force, coercion, domination, and control, and motivates largely through fear. This form of power is built on a belief that power is a finite resource that can be held by individuals, and that some people have power and some people do not. It may rule with weapons that are physical or by controlling the resources we need to live, money, food, medical care, or more subtle resources like information, approval, and love. We are so accustomed to power over and so steeped in its language and implicit threats that we often become aware of its functioning only when we see extreme manifestations. Okay. Oh, so that might sound familiar, this idea of power, force, domination, Co coercion, control, power is finite, and I want it, and I can't have you have it, right? This is just another way to look at sin, right? Um, so when we conflate that with God's will for us, like that third um, thing that I mentioned, that's scary. We do not want it. This is not the way, right? That's not God's character either. That's why he gave us free will. He's not into coercion. If you think about light also, we're supposed to be light. Uh, stars and the sun and the moon are not coercive. 
Um, this is not who we're supposed to be. This is not it. This is not the call. And anytime we get drawn into the culture wars, that is a fight over this kind of power. We don't need to have this kind of power. We have different kinds of power. And so all of that is just a huge funnel distraction into something we don't need and we weren't designed for. Uh, and as soon as we get it, we're most likely to just start abusing it because that's that's the only way. Like you can't have force and coercion and violence um, that withholds love and approval in a healthy manner. <laughs> that doesn't exist, right? Um, the reasons that we know this is not what we're supposed to have. Genesis 12, um, Abraham has spoken to. We are called in the early church, the children of Abraham, right? Paul is very clear about that. Uh, Jesus is clear about that. John the Baptist is clear about that. We are now, as part of God's household, the children of Abraham. And Abraham was told his whole thesis of his life, his mission, is to bless all nations. So to serve all nations, to consider them part of his family. And bless means to kneel, right? Kneel and serve them. So that's the opposite of a scepter, right? Um, those are different postures entirely saying, this is the way we're going to have our schools and this is what I'll allow and this is what our legal system should be. That's not like kneeling. That is a different kind of power, right? So we should be looking for this, not this. Christians should be thriving in places of servant leadership, not this. Okay, we also see that John 13, 3. This is super practical, super helpful, super important. So I'm going to read it. Jesus is about to be crucified. <laughs> He's about to die. He's about to be murdered. He's about to be abandoned by his friends, betrayed by one of them. Um, and they're getting ready. Satan's about to get his jazz on. Verse two, it says, so verse three, Jesus knew that the father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, supper laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. And then he washes the disciples' feet. Okay, so John 13, 3. Jesus knew, this is what he's thinking about when he's about to be betrayed by everybody, that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back from God. When we can say, yes, I am a servant. Um, yes, I am here uh with all these things that God has given me and I'm going to die and go back and be with God and the reason I came here and the reason I was made was God formed me that enables us to be in the servant posture again he doesn't realize that and then like kill Herod and take over um that's not that's not it that's not the plan that's not the goal um last last section something that we miss totally sometimes Ephesians 6 is this big spiritual warfare passage and we see it sometimes and we're like oh demons um, but the very first line in that um, is we do not battle against flesh and blood but against these spiritual forces right and so again when we get drawn up in this culture war about whose church is going to be the biggest, whose policy is going to happen, who's going to have the biggest voice in the Supreme Court. All of those things um, are us trying to battle against flesh and blood. Anytime that we get caught up in our enemies um, rather than our mission, we are trying to battle against flesh and blood, against people. And it's very clear that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Spiritual forces might look like Traditionally, um, the way that passage is talked about, right? It might be actual demons, but it also might be depression. It also might be forms of inequity and injustice that bring suffering to people, right? That's what we're supposed to be fighting, not people. Okay, taking some time. That is not the kind of power, authority, and rulership that we are seeking to lean into. Important, that's why we gave it time. All right, this is the kind that we are supposed to be looking at. We've got power with and power within and then power to. So reading this again from social science, power with is the shared power that grows out of collaboration and relationships. It is built on respect, mutual support, shared power, solidarity, influence, empowerment, and collaborative decision-making. Power with is linked to social power, the influence we wield among equals. Right? That's the difference. If power is not a finite resource, power is something that we all have, then we get to collaborate rather than trying to like be the one person with the giant club. 
or mace or whatever. Power of with can help build bridges within groups, e.g. families, organizations, social change movements, or across differences, e.g. gender, culture, and class. Rather than domination and control, power with leads to collective action and the ability to act together, right? We're all the light of the world. I'm not the light of the world. Like Jesus dials it in to be individual, but his goal isn't just for you to see you're the light of the world. We all have this spirit. We all have this power and authority. We all have this rulership and this unique design. And so together, when we all understand that we're sharing that power, we can have power with one another. And that's also how you avoid white saviorism and all that weird stuff. Okay, power within is related to a person's sense of self-worth and self-knowledge. And includes an ability to recognize individual differences while respecting others. Power within involves people having a sense of their own capacity and self-worth. Um, we want to nurture power with and power to and power within rather than power over. So again, if you just see, oh, as a community, we can do a lot, but you know, not really me. Um, that's not, I've just been more of a background person. Wrong. <laughs> you are also, I know I'm just flipping the tables on what I just said, but you are also the sun. You are also a star. You have been put in the sky and yes, you're not the only star, but you are still a star. You are still this enormously powerful, um, blazing ball of light beaming across the universe um, faster than we can even conceive, right? So that is still who you are, even if you're part of a beautiful constellation and incredible universe. Last one, so important. Power two refers to the productive or generative potential of power and the new possibilities or actions that can be created without using the relationships of domination. It is built on the unique potential of every person to shape his or her life and world. It is the power to make a difference, to create something new, or to achieve goals. So the thing is here, um, we can just like settle back in this nice like soothing spa of a verse. Oh, I'm a shining beam of the universe or I'm the light of the world. That's so nice. Um, it is, and we need to know that and it needs to like infuse our being and be in our bones so that we're able to make the choice to go and serve. Um, but that's the important part, right? That's what Jesus is talking about, about putting the light under the basket. That's not it. <laughs> When we just sit here and say, yeah, Jesus loves me, this I know, no, no, da, 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 and then we end the story. That's not why we were made. We were made to be put on display in front of humanity, going about good and beautiful business, right? Shining, beaming our radiance, um, being vessels of the dawn, right? And that means pouring out our light upon every person that we happen to be in front of, all of humanity. Um, okay, so that's it. <laughs> We have to know all those things, not exercise it in creepy ways, not try to gain power over and view it as finite, but to honor everybody else, knowing that they also have it, know that it's within us, and then use that power to towards something. So let us do that. Um, let us be in deep knowledge of that and then choose not to just stay in our comfortable little zones, um, but to get outside, outside of them wherever we're being called to do so. So the kingdom can come everywhere, right? I'm going to pray. God, I thank you that you do not use power over with us. You are not coercive. You are not abusive. You are not um, violent toward your kids. That's not the way that you accomplish your will in the universe. In fact, the history of the universe is so long because of that. You could accomplish what you want to in an instant, but instead you have chosen to give us free will. Instead, you love power within us. You love power within one another as we join together. And you love when we use our power towards something um, that you have put on our minds and hearts and in our design. So I pray that we would be aware of that, that we would be aware of the ways that you made us. I pray that you would make us aware of our gifts and our challenges, um, the things that we love, the things that we are motivated by and things that we're passionate about um, and help us to not put it in a basket. Help us repent of the places in which we are um, we are hiding in our fortresses of comfort and convenience and consumerism and entertainment. 
um, and that we would step out and go about our good and beautiful business um, in front of other people, that your kingdom might come and your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. See y'all next week. Uh, if you want to join us online, fill out a form at refugepullman.com. If you want to give to support what we're doing in our community or what I'm doing, um, please also go to refugepullman.com. There's a button that says give. We'd love if you invested in what we're doing. Uh, all right, guys, have a great week.